On April the 13th, which is uh, when we normally have our deacons meeting, we're not having a deacons meeting here. We'll meet together out at the picnic. And I was just checking the uh, long-term forecast. Yesterday, they day before yesterday, they had a 40% chance of rain on the 13th. Yesterday, they had no rain on the 13th. Today, they're back to 40% on the 13th, but it looks like just scattered showers. So, uh, so far... Looks like uh, it's moving in a more positive direction, but we know how that usually goes, don't we? So, anyhow, the other um, thing is that we need Sunday school teachers, and if you're interested, uh, we you talk to either Cheryl Jeffries or Mark Friedrich, but we do need some to help out uh, teaching in, um, in the Sunday school classes. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have... A uh, few moments of silent prayer. It's important for us to be reminded about the fact that we have a number of people in the congregation that are ill. Uh, some are more significantly ill. Others are just fighting spring colds and whatever else seems to be going around. But it seems like I've heard of a number uh, of people just the last few days who've come down with something. So we need to be in prayer for that. We also need to be in prayer for Camp Arete and their preparations to get ready for that this coming, uh, this coming summer, as well as uh, some other things that are going on this, this summer. So uh, be in prayer for those things. And after a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for forgiveness of sin. What a tremendous thing, and sometimes as we've been believers for many years, we might take that a little more casually or um, treat it in a uh, less significant manner because we're so used to it. But this is remarkable that we have genuine forgiveness of sin, not based on anything we do. We don't have to make up for it. We don't have to uh, please you by being remorseful. We don't have to uh, go through various uh, works or things that would somehow uh, assuage our guilt, but we just simply admit and acknowledge our sins to you, and we're forgiven because Christ paid the penalty already. And with that forgiveness comes a cleansing from sin so that that sin no longer affects and breaks down our day-by-day uh, -day fellowship with you. Father, we pray that you would uh, help us to be more appreciative of your grace in our lives, thinking about it, not being forgetful of the things that you have given us each and every day. We thank you for what we're learning as we study the Davidic covenant and as we see your plan and purpose working out through Israel's history in its fulfillment at the first coming of Christ. Uh, Jesus, knowing that he fulfills these promise, prophecies and promises and that strengthens our faith, encourages us that we are not believing some, some myth or some fairy tale, but that this is the absolute truth, and it transforms who we are. And Father, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we are studying about the Davidic Covenant. We went through the key passages for the Davidic Covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 to 17, and 1 Chronicles 17, 11 to 14. And now what we're doing is looking at how the, Isaiah, how, uh, the Davidic Covenant uh, works its way out through the scriptures, through the events and prophecies and promises that come after 
uh, the time of David and how they are fulfilled in Jesus and how they are uh, referred to and alluded to in uh, the New Testament. And that's important because it strengthens our confidence in the truthfulness of Scripture and the accuracy of Scripture. So we have studied a little bit about covenants and I've been reminding you that a covenant is a, a legal document. It can be between two uh, who are peers. It can be between a superior and an inferior. It can be a gift, and it can be given uh, in order to motivate. Uh, the, ones that, the one that was given to motivate obedience in Israel was the Mosaic Covenant. It was patterned after what was known as the suzerain vassal treaty. But the other covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the uh, land covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the, seed, and the um, uh, new covenant are all patterned after what was known as a royal grant covenant, which was given t as a reward for uh, faithfulness. So it's not a means of salvation. We've seen that these promises were made in the Old Testament, and they are not fulfilled until the future, even though there may be things in history that are similar. They are not the same. Uh, this cause has caused a lot of um, confusion. It's caused a lot of uh, false teaching, uh, at, at the very least confusing teaching that has come along, the idea that somehow we're already in the kingdom, but it's not yet fully here. And that's often linked to some uh, erroneous views about the New Covenant, which is not part of our study. But the Davidic Covenant is uh, a, a very distinct covenant and emphasizes this fulfillment that is related to uh, Jesus coming at the first coming, pre presenting the kingdom. And so as we look at this, we see that in the Old Testament, the Abrahamic covenant is given to Abraham in approximately 2000 BC. And there are the three components to the Abrahamic covenant, God's promise of a land, a specific piece of real estate that would be the possession of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, in perpetuity. And then the second was that there's a seed, that through his seed, his descendants, all nations would be blessed. And then the third is that there would be uh, this, this worldwide blessing. So uh, these are then developed later on in what I call the real estate or the land covenant that is developed in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 30, and then also the Davidic covenant, which is what we're studying in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, and then the new covenant, all of which are fulfilled. And when we go through all these different passages that are set up that talk about the uh, when the new covenant is implemented, it's when there is a descendant of David on the throne in Jerusalem. It's a physical, geophysical kingdom on, uh, on, uh, on earth located in Jerusalem. It's not a spiritualized kingdom. And see, this is one of those uh, errors that developed in the late 19th century. You had your your, your trinity of, of bad guys in the in the um, uh, in the mid 19th century, you had Darwin and Marx and Freud, and they shift significantly shifted the whole focus of of Western civilization, and they borrowed a lot of ideas from Christianity at the same time, completely rejecting uh, anything that was that was uh, Christian. But this, they, they developed this idea that man could bring in a utopia. This is Satan's uh, great lie, is that human beings can bring in a utopia that we're not really sinful. That all of this is based on the idea that we're not really uh, that corrupt. We're not all that bad. We can do bad things, but we're not really sinners. We're not corrupt. We're not... Uh, spiritually dead. We can do good things, and if human beings are innately good as opposed to innately evil, then uh, they can be improved upon. And if you're basically good, 
then you can be perfected. If you're not basically good, then you can be improved a little bit, but you can't be perfected. And this has a political implication that developed in the late 19th century on uh, different forms of utopic political ideas that man can bring in a utopic kingdom. And so the, the liberals, influenced by 19th century uh, German uh, rationalism and liberalism, uh, tweaked their understanding of the Bible, still used biblical language, but they were talking about the fact that with, we could improve society uh, through, that that was the real purpose of the gospel, was to change society. And so that became known as the social gospel. And we would continue to improve society, and man would get better and better until this utopia would be reached. And then, uh, then the Messiah would come if there, if there was, a, was a Messiah. Walter, Walter Rauschenbusch was sort of the father of the social gospel movement. Well, today we've modified that terminology, and it's the social justice movement. But it's... it's, it's a, a perversion of a Christian idea that history is linear and moving towards a, a perfect society. Uh, the Bible teaches that it is linear and it's moving towards a perfect society, and that's the perfect society of the Messianic kingdom when the Lord Jesus Christ will rule on the throne of David from Jerusalem. And we won't have uh, bib true biblical justice in society until that takes place. Because until that takes place, men will rule other men, and because of sin, they will always be corrupt. That's why it is necessary to have checks and balances in any government that, that will actually work in order to uh, prevent evil men from tyrannizing others. So the Davidic covenant has implications for a political theory and a theory of justice, because when you go through a lot of these passages that are, especially in the prophets of Isaiah, Jeremiah, there's condemnation of, the, uh, of Israel and of Judah because of injustice. But it's not because they, uh, the government wasn't taking care of the poor. It's because the people in the culture had paganized and rejected biblical truth, and so they had no compassion and care on a personal level for those who were less fortunate. And that's where you have to start building your whole concept uh, of, of, of biblical justice. And uh, what the scripture teaches is that this is just going to be the continuous cycle throughout history until the Messiah comes and uh, destroys evil, sends Satan into uh, uh, the abyss and chains him there for a thousand years. And that's the first time that we'll have true perfect government because we will have a true perfect king. So that's sort of the background for understanding the Davidic covenant. And we've worked through this looking at several things. Just a reminder, the Abrahamic covenant focusing on those three elements of the land, seed, and blessing are further developed in additional covenants. And these covenants become, they're an ironclad contract that God has made with the Jewish people, first through Abraham, and then in terms of the land covenant and the Davidic covenant, and then the new covenant. And so they, they're unconditional and they're eternal. They'll never be rolled back. And this is why it is so important to uh, be philo-Semitic as opposed to anti-Semitic. It's interesting, when we were at uh, APAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee uh, National Policy Conference two weeks ago, that, or was it a week ago? I can't remember. I think we came back a week ago. When we were there, the, the speakers consistently talked about um, talked about the rise and increase of anti-Semitism in the world today. And it's getting worse and worse in Europe. It is far worse than what's reported uh, in the uh, American mainstream media. You have to look at uh, uh, media that's published in Israel or look at some of the other uh, 
better media such as Gatestone Institute that does an outstanding job of reporting about what is going on uh, in Europe. And there you learn how horrible this is, but there are increasing incidents in the United States, and we hear about politicians, some of the new politicians, the Muslim uh, politicians are making these uh, horrific anti-Semitic statements. The Abrahamic covenant is still in effect. Those who bless Israel, God will bless. Those who curse Israel, God will curse. And that applies to them, uh, whether it's individual in terms of your next door neighbor, or whether it is the nation of Israel, uh, whether they are, in, and that's been true throughout history. I've heard some people from some uh, political persuasions who think that, well, because the Jews rejected Jesus and, is, and the Jews are out under the fifth cycle of discipline, that that doesn't apply for today. Well, it applies for today in the same way that it applied in the Old Testament. When God destroyed uh, Israel through the use of the Babylonians, uh, in 586 BC, because the Babylonians turned, and, and earlier the Assyrians, both turned anti Semitic, that God destroyed those nations. And then when uh, he, he used the Persians to destroy the, um, to destroy the, the Babylonians, and then under the Persian administration, that's when you have the incident with uh, Artaxerxes and Hadassah in the Hebrew, Esther in, in English, and the anti-Semitism of, of Haman, and that was just uh, celebrated a month ago in the Jewish community, their re remembrance of that event at, at Purim and how God protected them. And so that is an incident that happens when, when Israel was out under the fifth cycle of discipline. They're scattered throughout the nations. They were not uh, necessarily uh, focused on God or obedient to God or, or religious at all. In fact, when you read through Esther, you never see the name of God mentioned. You don't hear, see any prayers uh, anything of that nature, but God is still true to the Abrahamic covenant because it's unconditional. And even when uh, the Jews and Israel are in disobedience to God, God is going to be faithful to them. And what's the point of application to, for that? When you are out of fellowship, when you're in rebellion against God, when you are disobedient, God is still going to be faithful to you. And God is still going to be gracious to you and provide for you just as he's done uh, for the Jews. That doesn't mean you won't go through divine discipline. We'll study the great divine discipline that David that goes through after his sin with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah coming up in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 10. But the Abrahamic covenant is still in effect. So that means that we are to be very pro uh, Jewish and pro-Israel. One thing that means, pro-Israel doesn't mean you agree with everything the Israeli government uh, wants to do, all their policies. Most Jews, I mean, if, you know, there's a proverb that if you have two Jews, you have three opinions. Well, in Israel, there's like 18 or 20 political parties. And that means there's... there's um, usually about 15 political parties that aren't part of the majority rule at that time, and they don't agree with what the government's doing. So that's, that's not what we mean uh, by supporting Israel. We support their right to defend themselves as a nation, their right to exist as a nation, their right to live and exist in peace without having to worry about terrorists blowing them up or uh, uh, planting IEDs or, or flying uh, fire bombs with kites over their, uh, over their land and burning their crops. They have a right to a uh, peaceful existence. The Davidic covenant, as we've seen, is a specific promise to David of an eternal house, a dynasty that will end with an eternal person, an eternal kingdom, meaning that that eternal person is a king, and there will be an eternal kingdom, and then an eternal uh, throne. Last time I pointed out these two words, diachronic and intertextual, good words to learn. Diachronic, dia means through, dia from the Greek preposition dia, chronic from chronos meaning time. 
And that's when we studied a word, how, it, how Moses used a word, then later how Samuel used that word, later how David used that word, how uh, it's used by Isaiah, Jeremiah, that words change meaning or they uh, modify a little bit over time. Uh, so you study a word or you study an idea, a doctrine as it's developed uh, through time. So that's what we're doing here is looking at how the Davidic covenant is used and and um, uh, referred to over time in the Old Testament. And intertextual is a term that is describing how a phrase or word picks up on something related to the Davidic covenant from one text, that is from Psalms or from Isaiah or from I, uh, Jeremiah. And so that, that alludes back to the Davidic covenant. Now, I broke this down for you in terms of this chronology. This is what we're... What happened? Yeah. Okay. This is weird. Barb? We have to figure this out. This is strange, because if I try to put the screen, the arrow over here... It was doing something strange. Okay, so we looked at, um, we started off with uh, Hosea and Amos, and now we're looking at Isaiah. These were prophets in the 8th century, leading up to the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel, which occurred in 722 B.C. Uh, we'll go from there. We'll probably f not finish all the Isaiah references I want to look at tonight, but we'll come back next time. Finish Isaiah, then look at Jeremiah and a couple of passages in Ezekiel and Zechariah. And that's all I'm going to do. I mean, there's just dozens of these passages. And if you were here for the conference and you heard um, Steve Gerg go through all of those messianic uh, prophecies, just one after another, he, he moved very quickly and didn't get dig down very much in each of those prophecies, but you just get overwhelmed with the fact that there's a lot of different prophecies. So when we get into Isaiah, uh, one of the key words that develops in the major prophets, uh, key terms to refer to the Messiah is the promise or is the name or title that he is the branch. He is the branch that comes out of the uh, uh, out of the stump of Jesse. So the idea of a stump is the idea that a tree's been cut down and so it's no longer growing. Uh, that's thought of as dead. And so Jesse, the father of David, is viewed as the, the stump. And then there's this green branch that begins to grow after a while out of what was thought to be a dead stump. And it is that green branch that eventually will grow and flourish. And that is a picture of the Messiah who will come he is a descendant of David coming out of the root of Jesse, and he will bring blessing to the, to the nations. Now, this uh, terminology actually goes back to, as I pointed out uh, several weeks ago, in 2 Samuel 23, 5, David is, writes this psalm, and he says, Although my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and secure, for this is all my salvation and my desire. Will he not make it increase is how it's translated in the English. But the word there that is, that is used in the Hebrew is the word uh, tzamak in the, the verb form, will he not make it grow or sprout or branch. And so that's the root. The noun that is used is tzamak, which also means a branch or sprout. And this, this idea of the branch is seen in Isaiah 4.2 and Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, where it's talked about the branch of David. And then my servant, the branch, in Zechariah 3.8. And then the man whose name is the branch in Zechariah 6.2. Those are 
not all of the passage we're going, passages we're going to look to, but those are the ones that mention the branch. And then when we come to the end of the Bible, we come to the end of the New Testament, we have a statement in Revelation 22, 16, almost the last verse of the Bible, very close, within five verses. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches, and he picks up all of this imagery. If you don't know Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, these passages, then you, you, you don't catch what he's saying. He says, I am the root and the offspring of David. He's talking about himself as the branch, the bright and morning star. So we started to look at this to some degree a few weeks ago in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. So turn with me in your Bibles, and we'll just review, and I'll add a few things to what I said uh, a couple of weeks ago in Isaiah uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 2. As we look at this, we talk about uh, Isaiah. Isaiah as a prophet, and one of these days I'm going to teach Isaiah, but it won't be uh, verse by verse, and it won't take 10 years. Um, Isaiah is, a, is arguably the most messianic of the Old Testament prophets. He addresses the current problems, failures, sins of, of Israel and Judah by telling them that eventually they will be judged by God. They'll be taken out, taken captive by uh, Assyria. They'll be uh, 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 taken out again and destroyed by Babylon and that they would eventually return back to the land, but there would not be a resolution of the problems until the future uh, Davidic king, the one who fulfills the, um, uh, fulfills the covenant with David, would arrive, and that he would be called Emmanuel. And that's what we'll look at mostly tonight is that section in Isaiah 7, 8 and 9, that's called the Emmanuel section. And so he, he will come as a servant king. That's described later in Isaiah uh, 42 and Isaiah 49 and 50, as well as in Isaiah uh, chapter 53, where he is the, the aspect of his servanthood is further defined as the one who is the substitute who will justify the many. And that's in Isaiah 52, 13 to Isaiah 53, 12. And then uh, as you continue to read in Isaiah, we're told about the remnant that will be saved, the establishment of the kingdom, and the coming of the future messianic king, uh, all through those latter chapters in Isaiah. But you have messianic prophecy earlier in Isaiah from the fourth chapter. In that day, the branch of the Lord, the, literally the branch of Yahweh, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. That's talking about the remnant. So right away we're told that this, the blessing that comes from the branch, is for the remnant. And the remnant is a term that is used of the believers in Israel, those who were faithful to the Lord, believed in him for salvation, uh, were justified, and were obedient to the, to the Lord. And, what, and the context here warns of a judgment that is uh, described in the first verse, and then in verse 2, it starts off with a phrase that is significant in Isaiah. Many times he says, in that day, in that day. And more often than not, when he talks about in that day, it is talking about the time of judgment that comes. In that day of the Lord usually is what the reference is to. And the term day of the Lord, although it's applied a couple of times to historic judgments, for the most part, they are yet 
unfulfilled judgments and are referring to that time of judgment that occurs in what we refer to as the tribulation, the seven years, the last seven years of Daniel's timetable from Daniel chapter uh, 7. Uh, and that is, uh, that's the great tribulation. It's uh, t called... Um, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, it is specifically related to God's final judgment on unbelieving Israel and bringing them to a understanding of who the Messiah is, and, and they believe in the Messiah at that time. So it's talking about that time of judgment described in verse 1, in that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. This is when the Messiah comes, is at the end of that time period, when Israel turns back to God. And we saw that in Hosea chapter, uh, chapter 3. Uh, we uh, talked about that in Isaiah 3, 4, that there's an order from Deuteronomy 30, verse, verses 1 through 3, to Hosea uh, uh, three, four, and five, that there's an order where first Israel turns back to God, God regathers them to the land, and then establishes that uh, end time Davidic kingdom. So, in that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. One thing we ought to note there, it's not clear from the English translation, and it's not necessarily that obvious from the Hebrew either. It's just, you just have two words, and it's in a, what's called a construct state, which is, is a confusing grammatical term, but it indicates that the Lord is a genitive, it's the source. And so it's not the branch simply of the Lord, but from the Lord. It is showing the source of the branch, that the Messiah is given by the Lord to his people Israel. So it is the branch from the Lord. And then we have, um, uh, then we have the statement that, that comes up next, that he is a beautiful and glorious. And these are words that, especially beautiful, that's more often used of God, not so much of, of human beings. And so that indicates uh, deity, but what really indicates that the branch of the lo Lord is divine as well as human is what we read when we get down into verses uh, 4 and 5. And what happens is that those who are under judgment in verse 1 are cleansed in verses 4 and 5. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. Now this isn't talking about just getting a bath. This isn't talking about the physical removal of dirt from the flesh as, as Peter puts it in, in 2 Peter. Uh, this is talking about spiritual cleansing, and that imagery of being uh, washed physically is used throughout the uh, throughout Exodus in talking about the the cleansing of the priests. That when a high priest was initially installed in his office, he was washed from head to toe, and then afterward, because that initial washing was uh, a picture of his being completely cleansed of sin as he enters into this new position. It's analogous to the believer who is completely cleansed of sin, is positionally uh, forgiven when he's placed in Christ. And then afterward, any time the priest was coming to, uh, to worship the Lord, he had to wash his hands and wash his feet. He didn't have to take a, a bath anymore. And that's the same imagery that Jesus used and referred to in John chapter 13. In the, um, in the upper room as he is celebrating the Seder, the Last Supper, with his disciples the night before he went to the cross, he's not simply demonstrating that he is a servant by washing the disciples' feet. He is teaching them something, and this comes out in the conversation with Peter when Peter says, no, 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 Lord, you're not going to wash me. And you're not going to do this. I'm not going to let it happen. And Jesus makes a really tough statement there. 
it sounds like he's really being cruel to Peter. And he says, well, Peter, if you don't let me do this, you will have no part in my kingdom. That's the English translation. And that's like, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, you're not going to get into heaven. That's not what he is saying. First of all, inheriting the kingdom is not a synonym for getting into heaven. It has to do with role and responsibility in the kingdom. The word translated part, sometimes we think of part sort of like uh, if you audition for a part in a play, uh, you get cast in a part in a television show, something like that. Uh, it has to do with something related to a role. But the word that's translated there had a more significant meaning in Greek, and it's the idea of inheritance. And it's the portion of your inheritance. This is what the uh, prodigal son said when he came to his father and said, I want my meros, I want my share of my inheritance. And that's what he took and that's what he uh, squandered and afterward ended up in the pigsty with nothing because he was uh, uh, living just to satisfy his own desires. So that's what Jesus is saying to Peter, is that if you don't let me cleanse you, then you won't have a share, an inheritance in the kingdom. You'll be there, but you won't have an inheritance. And so he, there's, a, there's two words that are used there in the Greek. The first one is a word, nipto. And Greek is more precise than Hebrew. Hebrew just had one word for uh, washing. But in, the, in Greek, they had two words. They had a word that meant uh, just partial washing, like when you wash your hands, you wash your feet, you wash your face. It was just a partial washing. That's what Jesus is using. And then he said, but all of you, talking about the disciples, except one, talking about Judas Iscariot, all of you, except one, have been cleansed, have been washed. And then he uses a different word. He doesn't use nipto. He uses the word uh, luo, L-O-U-O. And there. There he is talking about a complete washing. That word is a word you'd use if you were talking about getting a bath. And that language is significant because if you go back to Exodus chapter 40, when Aaron and his sons are installed as priests, they are washed and the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, translates that initial washing at their uh, installation with the Greek word luo, but then when it talks about their washing their hands and washing their feet at the basin uh, going into the tabernacle, the, the, the Greek used the word uh, nipto. And Jesus is using those words specifically to show that there's this comparison that just as a priest had to be cleansed and uh, he'd already been cleansed once at, at the initiation when he became a priest. After that, he just needed to wash his hands and feet. He's saying that to, to Peter. And then he goes a little bit further later on in that same meal, and he talks about this is what you're to do to one another. And if, if cleansing has to do with forgiveness, then what Jesus then says is when he says, do this to one another, he's not talking about being be each other's servant. He's saying, forgive one another. And then at the end of the whole discussion in John 13, 34 and 35, he says, this is what you're supposed to do. You're to love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus love them? He forgave them of, of their sin. And so that's what he's teaching through that, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that means that you are not going to hold, thing, hold grudges, uh, you're not going to be bitter and angry, you're going to forgive one another. And so all of this then uh, goes back to these ideas that are present in the Old Testament. And in verse 4, this is the imagery that Isaiah is using, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. That's their sin. That is all of the horrible things that they did in idolatry, including the uh, immolation, the fiery sacrifice of their infants in the arms of Moloch and Chemosh. So this is going to be washed away and purged. This is the other word that is used, the other synonym that is used for cleansing 
in the Mosaic law. So it's talking about that the blood of Jerusalem is the way she has murdered the prophets, the, the murder of these infants in the arms of the idols, and all of that. This is going to be cleansed, and then they are going to uh, go into the kingdom. So verse 4 talks about that forgiveness, that there is a uh, a cleansing that takes place. Only God can cleanse. So that tells us that the branch of the Lord forgives and cleanses, and only God can do that. But this term is also a term that is developed in Isaiah and Jeremiah, as we'll see, that it, he's human. He is uh, fully human. So there's strong uh, hints here that the branch, the Messiah, is a descendant of David, He's human, and he is also uh, fully God. Now, in um, back up one, the next sentence in four two, the fruit of the earth, and this is another one of those places where there's uh, a um, a tendency to translate the Hebrew word earth as earth instead of land, and when we get into uh, some older Old Testament passages, for example, in Numbers 13.26, talking about the spies that went into the land, and they came back, and what did they bring with them? They brought, and it's the same phrase in the Hebrew that you have uh, in, in Isaiah uh, 4.2. But here it's translated correctly, the fruit of the land. And so uh, then it's stated the same way in Deuteronomy 125. They also took some of the fruit of the land. And so this phrase that we find here in, in Isaiah uh, 4.2, the, the, the branch is the fruit of the land. All this is agricultural imagery, the branch that comes out of the stump, and it's the produce of the land of Israel. So it reinforces this idea that the, uh, this future king, the branch, is a product of Israel. And even in the New Testament, you have a statement in, um, I think I have it here somewhere. No, I don't. I thought I had the uh, scripture there. It's in Hebrews, and it alludes to this same thing that the, uh, that the Messiah is a product of Judah. In Hebrews 7.14, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, from the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses uh, spoke nothing concerning priesthood. But the point is that the Messiah is Jewish. The Messiah comes out of the tribe of, of, of Judah. And so these interconnections this intertextuality is very, uh, very important. In fact, it was understood to be this way by, uh, by the rabbis historically. One of the prayers that, is, that was uh, pulled together in the early part of the church age in Judaism was call, is called the Amidah. And it is uh, prayed by a rabbi or with the congregation, joining him in a different, on different feast days and special days on the calendar of Israel. And I've been in synagogue before where uh, they, we, they pray the prayer of the Amidah. And in the, it's got a series of blessings and the 15th benediction is speedily cause the branch of the servant of David to flourish. Isn't that, they, that's right there in the Amidah, but they don't know what that means. The branch of our servant David, that refers to the Messiah, and they may recognize that, but they're praying for the Messiah to flourish, uh, to come forth. Exalt his horn by your salvation, because we hope for your salvation all the day. Blessed are you, O Lord, who causes the horn of salvation to flourish. They're praying for the Messiah to come. Sadly, they don't recognize that the Messiah has all, already uh, come and is here. So we see some important things here about uh, the branch. The branch is, is from uh, Israel, from the land. Uh, the branch is both God and man, 
and uh, the branch is going to be connected to uh, the house of David. Now, the next passage I want us to look at tonight that connects to the house of David and to the Davidic covenant is in Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. And the passage is that we all know, all Christians know this, whatever stripe you may be, because as if you're a Christian and you sing Christmas carols, then sooner or later you're going to sing uh, Christmas carols that talk about the Virgin. And if you're from a Roman Catholic background, then you pray to the Virgin. And in, in some ways, the Roman Catholics are more honest about the meaning of this passage than a lot of Protestants are today, because they understand that Isaiah 7.14 does literally refer to a virgin conception and birth. But among Protestants, this is, uh, this is not uh, so, so much anymore. But the prophecy is given in uh, Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And that's talking, uh, God is talking, or actually Isaiah, uh, as the mouthpiece of God, is talking to King uh, Ahaz, who is one of the most evil kings uh, in the Old Testament and in Judah. He is described in uh, related passages in um, in. Uh, kings and chronicles of having sacrificed his children in the arms of Molech. And so he was a, an a, unbeliever, he was an idolater, he committed infanticide and in burning up his uh, children in the arms of, uh, of Molech. He's just horrible. And yet God is condescending to him in his unbelief and saying that uh, you know, ask for a sign. Just ask for a sign. Anything you want, you just ask for it. I'll do it. Just to give you comfort that these guys aren't going to destroy you. And uh, in sort of a self-righteous arrogance, uh, like a lot of uh, people who reject the truth are, no, 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 no. I'm not going to test God. I'm not going to give God something to do. That would be sacrilegious. I have no basis for that, but that's how Ahaz was. We all have seen people who are that way. And so God says, I'll give you a sign. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. And he says, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. So it talks about two things here, a virgin conception and a virgin birth. I, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And the name Emmanuel is important because it is a title for the Messiah. And in context, we're going to learn again that this, uh, this person is connected to the house of David. Uh, those who call his name Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means God with us. This is then quoted by uh, the angel in talking to Joseph in Matthew 1.23, uh, he's citing this because Mary at that time has become pregnant, and the angel has announced this fact to Joseph and tells Joseph exactly what's going on and quotes from Isaiah 7.14 in Matthew 1.23 and says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. The E-L at the end is God. The I am is the Hebrew preposition with, and then you add a suffix to that, the A-N-U, and that is us. So M is with, Anu is us, and L is God. So it just means God with us. A clear statement that the virgin is human, going to give birth to a human son through a miraculous process of a virgin conception and virgin birth, and but that this isn't simply a human child, it will be known as God with us. That a, this is the clearest prophecy to this point that the Messiah is going to be both fully God and vo fully a man. And so Isaiah 7.14 uh, begins and gives us this introduction here 
to the virgin conception. This, this is a doctrine that is scoffed at by uh, numerous uh, critics of Christianity, rationalists, and others who reject uh, Christianity. It's also rejected by uh, Jews since the time of Jesus. And they have sought to retranslate this and uh, make other, um, uh, other twists of the scripture here to make it either apply to something that happened in the uh, 8th century with Isaiah, or it doesn't really literally mean a, a virgin. We see this even among some so-called evangelicals. A rather controversial uh, pastor by the name of Rob Bell, who founded a church uh, up in Michigan called uh, Mars Hill. He's part our leader in the emergent church movement. He's published a number of books where he has made extremely controversial uh, statements that I would consider to be heresy. For example, he has denied uh, that there is eternal punishment in the lake of fire. He, ha he teaches that eventually everybody is going to be saved. That usually goes together, that those who deny, not all those who deny a literal uh, eternal lake of fire are universalists. Some are annihilationists. They just believe that at some point they just go poof and they're no longer in, a, in existence. And in a book that he wrote uh, called The Velvet Elvis, he wrote... What if tomorrow someone digs up definitive proof that Jesus had a real earthly biological father named Larry? And archaeologists find Larry's tomb and do DNA samples and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the virgin birth was really just a bit of mythologizing the gospel that the gospel and the gospel writers threw in uh, to appeal to the followers of the Mithra and Dionysian religious cult. See, that's this idea that's out there in liberalism, that the writers of Scripture are not inspired by God. They got their ideas from other religions, and they just sort of massaged them around and came up with some, something new. So it's a complete denial of any sort of divine origin for what's in Scripture. And so their view of inspiration is a human inspiration on the order of uh, Shakespeare or John Milton or Mozart and doesn't have anything to do with objective divine revelation. And so these other cults have a sort of counterfeit virgin birth in some areas, and so that's what he's saying. So we're going to discover this, and there's no such thing as a virgin birth. And then he goes on to say, but what if, as you study the origin of the word virgin, you discover that the word virgin in the Gospel of Matthew actually comes from the book of Isaiah? And then you find out that in the Hebrew language at that time, the word virgin could mean several things. And what if you discovered that in the first century, being born of a virgin also referred to a child whose mother became pregnant the first time she had intercourse? See, what he's done is he's, saying, he's, he's basically going to claim that the word virgin doesn't really mean virgin, and this doesn't mean a miraculous conception and birth, and so uh, that's not necessary for, the, for Christianity whatsoever. And it, just, it, it just destroys biblical truth. It destroys the value of Scripture. And he's basically just making it up as he goes along, which is what the enemies of Christianity uh, tend to do. And this has become, uh, this is more common among uh, Jews who've rejected the messianic claims of Jesus, and it's typical of liberal Christians who deny any kind of divine origin uh, for, uh, for the scripture. The traditional historical Christian view is that this is a literal prophecy that is literally fulfilled in only one way, and that is in the birth of Jesus in approximately 3 or 4 uh, B.C. There is the liberal view that I just described where the woman's not a virgin at all. She's just a young woman of marriageable age. And then there's a more popular view that you may run into at times from modern scholars that is the idea that there's a multiple or dual fulfillment of these prophecies. Now, I've taught this in other places. 
There's no such thing as dual fulfillment. It's either fulfilled or it ain't. Okay? There's no such thing as partial fulfillment. And uh, there's a, this is a big issue now in, in hermeneutics, and it's a huge issue in uh, dispensationalism. And so you'll find a number of those on the progressive dispensationalist side who will come along and say, well, it's, it was partially fulfilled at Isaiah's time, and, um, and then it's, it has its complete fulfillment at the time of Jesus, or it was fulfilled at the time of Isaiah, and that passage is just sort of massaged by New Testament writers and applied to Jesus. In other words, there's no literal messianic prophecy. And that is a position that has, was taken by, uh, and, and I wasn't even smart enough to realize these were all issues when I, first, when I was in seminary, and it didn't become clear to me until some time later. But I was taught this dual fulfillment idea when I was, when I was in seminary. Uh, Michael Rydelnik says that when he went to Dallas, which was about my second or third year in Dallas, he interviewed all the Old Testament professors and said not one of them truly believed in Messianic prophecy. And so he majored in Greek because he didn't want to fight battles all the time. And I know that at the conference when uh, Steve Gare was here and spoke on Messianic prophecy, he said that at the time he was at Dallas, the Old Testament department believed there were maybe three or four Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. And then um, Andy Woods was uh, talking afterwards and said that when he was a student in the early 2000s, that they said there was only one sure Old Testament passage, and that was Psalm our Messianic prophecy, that was Psalm 110.1. So I believe there are many specific, literal uh, prophecies related to Jesus. So what's the context here? That's really important to pay attention to the context here. The prophecy is that this is a sign. A, A sign does not necessarily mean it's a miracle, but it does mean that it's so out of the ordinary that it's going to get everybody's attention, and you're going to know that it is pointing to something. A sign signifies something significant. You like the way I use the word S-I-G-N there? A sign signifies something significant. And uh, a young maiden getting pregnant and having a baby is not something that is Uh, unusual or significant. It happens every single day. Young girls of marriageable age that are not married get pregnant every day. That's not so significant. But for a young woman of marriageable age who has never been intimate with a man to get to conceive and give birth, now that's something that's going to get everybody's attention. And that's exactly what this is talking about. But we have to understand a little bit about the background. Uh, The background has to do with God's judgment on Israel. And there's going to be two, two aspects to this prophecy. Not dual fulfillment, but it has it's directed two ways. And you know that not in the English. But you know that because when you get to Isaiah 7.14, what happens is that you start seeing a shift from a, a, in the pronouns. And so the you in the Hebrew is either going to be you all or it is going to be you singular. And that is what makes the difference. So this happens at a time when the uh, Northern Kingdom is truly in apostasy. All of their kings followed the uh, sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nevat, and committed evil. Just a little word about evil. Evil is a word that modern Americans don't like. You call somebody evil and you're just off the, off the edge. You're out of bounds. The problem with that is the Bible is very specific about the meaning of the word evil. The evil that was committed by Jeroboam, the son of Nevat, was that he set up alternate worship, alternate idols in the northern kingdom, one in Bethel, one up in the north at at Dan. And evil, watch carefully that word. 
the majority of the uses of the word evil relate to idolatry. So anyone who's worshiping a false god, anyone who is denying the existence of God, anyone who is uh, involved in any sort of, of worship of any other religion is evil. That's the biblical definition of the term. And when Christians start compromising on that, you're compromising on the truth of God's word. Nobody can communicate based on biblical definitions anymore. So we have to stand our ground on those issues. So Ahaz is the king of, uh, of Judah. He's the son of Uzziah. Uh, but Uzziah was uh, uh, a man who worshiped the Lord. He committed a, a sin of, where he was impetuous and went into the temple. And God judged him for that. And he was a leper during the last part of his life. But Ahaz is his son, and he's, he's idolatrous. Uh, and there's going to be a coalition uh, between those in the north, the northern kingdom of Israel, and uh, their king is uh, Pika, and Rezin, or Ratzin, as it is in the Hebrew, he's the king of Syria. And so the Syrian king and, and the king of Israel get together, and they say, we can't, we, you know, Ahaz just isn't going to play our game, and he's not going to come along with us, so we need to get rid of him. We need to dump him, and we need to replace him with our own puppet king. And so this is what their, their plan is. They're going to uh, dump, uh, dump Ahaz, and they're going to replace him with someone who's not a descendant of David. So this is a satanic assault on the Davidic line and the Davidic covenant right off the bat. Now, it isn't clear until we get to verse 2. And it was told to the house of David. Oh, now all of a sudden we see that the real issue here has to do with the Davidic di dynasty and the continuation of the Davidic dynasty on the throne of David. And so uh, the house of David is another way of talking about Ahaz, because he's the king. And they learned that serious forces were deployed in Ephraim. So they're coming down for an attack. And what happens? His heart and the heart of all the people, they just start shaking. They're falling apart. They're scared to death because they don't have uh, the military capability to defeat this northern alliance. And so it's very picturesque. Uh, their hearts are moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. Think about a tornado coming through and how it's shaking all the trees. That's the imagery that's there. So the area we're talking about in the light tan here, this is Syria. The purple is Israel, the northern kingdom. So they've joined forces, and they're going to attack uh, Judah in the south. Here's another uh, map showing the same kind of thing. Here you have Judah in the south, and up here you have Syria, known as Aram in the Old Testament, and then the, the, the northern kingdom. So that's a big battle. Now the Lord comes along and says to Isaiah, go out now to meet Ahaz and take your son, Sher Yashiv, with you. Now, very few people, if they're dealing with any kind of a non-virgin interpretation of the passage, will ever tell you why was it necessary for him to take Shar Yeshub with him. And the reason is that when you get down to verse uh, 16, or excuse me, uh, yes, yeah, 16, for before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. That child mentioned there, King James uh, puts it uppercase, it should be lowercase. It's not talking about Emmanuel. It's talking about shared Yashub. And that is a, uh, pr the promise to Ahab, Ahaz, so that he will know that the, the, the dominance that's coming from the, um, the northern kingdom and, and Syria is not going to last more than 65 years. So he says, go out to meet Ahaz, you and share Yashiv, your son. And at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. That's pretty precise, telling us exactly where it is. This isn't just some generalization. And say to him, this is what Isaiah is supposed to say to Ahaz. Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted. 
for these two, two stubs of smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of Rezin in Syria and the son of Remaliah. Stubs of smoking firebrands is uses the word for stub is the word for tail. It's the tail end. That you, you light a torch and you get a big flame, but as it burns up its fuel in the torch, what happens? The, the flame diminishes and it starts to go out and you're at the tail end of the fire. And that's what God is saying. What you're seeing, all this excitement, everything they're doing, they're just at the tail end of their, of, of their dominance. And their ability to uh, dominate Judah is just about over with. So in verse 5 we read, Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have plotted against you. Now I put in there, it's a second masculine singular. That means he's talking to Ahaz. They have plotted uh, against you, uh, plotted against you as the representative of what? The house of David. And they plotted against you and sa said, let's go up against Judah and trouble it and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, uh, the son of Tabeel. And so they're going to bring in this uh, non-Davidic candidate to be the king over Judah and wipe out the house of David. This isn't the first time. Uh, remember uh, what happened with Athaliah and uh, uh, Josiah, and she tries to kill all of her, she kills all of her grandchildren, but uh, jo uh, Josiah is hidden and protected by the high priest. So, God's final word to Ahaz is, this won't stand, nor will it come to pass. I'm going to overrule all their desires. They may want to destroy you, but I'm going to overrule. And then God says, the head of Syria is Damascus. That's the capital. The head of Damascus is Rezin. He's the king. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken so that it will not be a people. In 65 years, the northern kingdom is going to be gone. The Assyrians are going to wipe it out in 722 uh, BC. Then in verse 9, the head of Ephraim is Samaria. and That's the capital city. And the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son, that's Pekah. And then God addresses him with a plural you. If you will not believe, that is talking to uh, the nation, surely you shall not uh, be established. Then in verse 10, Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, Ahaz, ask for a sign for yourself. Now he shifts. He's, he just mentioned plural, okay, talking about the people. Now he says, ask for yourself uh, from the Lord a sign. Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord, your God, singular. Ask it either in the depth or the height below. That's a merism. It's, you know, it covers anything. Ask whatever you want. Uh, just like you have uh, day and night, meditate on God's word day and night. Those are the two extremes. That means all the time. Uh, so here it's either in the depth or in the height, as far as you go down or as far as you go up. In other words, ask whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. But Ahaz says, very self-righteously, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, this is God speaking, hear now, and notice he goes back to the plural. Plural addresses the house of David. Hear now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you, house of David, to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Now, I think this is, uh, this is excuse me, the he here should be uh, Isaiah. Isaiah said, and he's addressing the house of David. And so therefore the Lord himself will give you, plural, a sign. The sign is to the house of David, uh, that this virgin will conceive and bear a son, so the bearing of the son is related to a sign of the continuation of the house of David. The eternal dynasty, the eternal throne, the eternal kingdom. So then 
we read in this verse, it's the virgin, it's not a virgin, as some translations put it. It is the virgin indicating a specific virgin. That this goes back to the Genesis 3.15 uh, prophecy given to, um, given to uh, Eve and uh, Adam and Eve, I will put in between, between you, speaking to the serpent, between you and the woman, and between your seed, the seed of the serpent, and her seed. That's the hostility between Satan and the plan of God. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is called the uh, Proto-Evangelium or the first indication of the gospel. And this is an indication that, uh, of, of a unique birth because you have this phrase that it, uh, between your seed, that is talking to the serpent, and her seed. Women produce eggs. They do not produce seed. Semen or, or sperm are what is produced by the male. So saying that the woman produces seed indicates something quite unusual. And so there was a history there related to the virgin that this would be, uh, this would, there would be a woman who would give birth to the seed promised to Eve in Genesis 3, uh, 15. Verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will conceive. Now this is the word Alma. The word that's usually translated virgin is another word, it's Betula. But Betula can refer to an older woman who is a virgin. And, and in some cases, she's not a virgin. She's just an, an, an older uh, woman who is looking to get married. But an Alma... Why it doesn't mean specifically virgin, it refers to a young woman of marriageable age, and it has to be very young, 14, 15, 16 years of age, and in our culture that may be almost impossible to find, but when you're living in the time of the Mosaic law, if you were 14, 15, and 16, and you weren't married and you weren't a virgin, you were going to be executed under the Mosaic law. So you would not find a, 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 an unmarried young woman who wasn't a virgin uh, in, in that culture, in that society. And so you can look at various places where Alma is used. It's only used six times in the... Uh, Old Testament, and five of, uh, or excuse me, three of those don't give any any con contextual clues as to its meaning. But in Genesis twenty four forty three, uh, this is when uh, Eliezer has come looking for a wife for Isaac, and the virgin he's. Uh, He's standing, he's praying, he says I, to God, he says, I stand by the well of water and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes out to draw water, that's how it's translated. It's understood that one of the uh, young women who would come out to draw water from the well that was of marriageable age uh, would be a virgin. And Miriam is referred to as a virgin in Exodus 2.8, the sister, the younger sister of Moses uh, who uh, was following him when he was in the basket in the in the Nile, and so that she came forward to volunteer her mother as a, as a wet nurse. Also, it's used as a virgin in Song of Solomon to those who would accompany the uh, bride in the wedding festival. So this is definitely a sign. Then when we get to seven fifteen, it says he will eat curds and honey. Now a lot of people look at this and they go, hmm. That indicates some sort of, of, of wealth, but that's not what this indicates. Uh, curds are made from, when, and especially an, uh, an overabundance of, um, of dairy, and what happened after the Assyrians wiped out the northern kingdom, what you had was the, the fields were destroyed, and so the, the cattle, the livestock multiplied. You had an abundance of dairy, and because you had wildflowers growing in the fields, the bees pollinated, and so you had an abundance of honey. And it indicates the impoverished diet of those who had been defeated in war. And the indication there is that the Messiah would be in an environment of oppression. Judah is under uh, the thumb of Rome at the time that the Messiah came. So... 
That's, that's what that is talking about. And then verse 16 goes back to talking about Shar Yashiv and says, before he's old enough uh, to reject evil and choose what is right, uh, the land whose two kings you fear will be desolate. They will be wiped out because Assyria is coming and they're going to be defeated and you're not going to have to worry about their, their armies uh, anymore. So this takes us to the next passage, which we'll get to next, next week in Isaiah 9, uh, talking about uh, the various titles for God and Emmanuel once again. So it's really clear. Matthew 123 quotes from a literal prophecy uh, that was given, and it is fulfilled historically one time, and that is when Jesus was born. Let's bow our heads and we'll close in prayer. Father, thanks for this time that we've had to go through these, this wonderful prophecy showing again and again that you fulfilled a promise to David. You protected the Davidic line. You provided for the coming of the Messiah through the Davidic line, as emphasized by Matthew in Matthew chapter 1, that he was the son of Abraham, the son of uh, David, and that he was therefore qualified to be the Messiah and the ruler of Israel. And Father, we pray that we might be strengthened and encouraged knowing how these prophecies were, were given and how they were fulfilled and that, that you are going to be true to your promise to give the house of David an eternal kingdom, an eternal uh, throne, and that his line and rule would go on through an eternal kingdom. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.